welcome back. We are going to look at, is it, can everyone hear me? Just please state anything that if you can hear me. Uh, so we are continuing with types of reactions and we're gonna be looking at uh, single displacement reactions. So single displacement reactions, a little bit different from the synthesis and decomposition that we just looked at. So this is how they, they look. So this is a simplified look of, um, of a synthesis, uh, sorry, of a single and double, a uh, single displacement reaction, sorry. So you have something on its own, hence the name single. So here we've got an atom that's single, combined with some kind of com uh, combination of atoms. This combination are typically ionic. Okay, so which means metal, non-metal. So this would be the metal, this would be the non-metal. So in other words, and I, and I color coded this specifically because if we're saying that the first element or first atom is a metal, the second is the non-metal, then that means that this single atom is also going to be a metal. So the second example shows where, oh, We've got still first one metal, non-metal, but this single is a non-metal. So what happens is the single atom, if it's a metal, will switch places with the metal combination. Okay, so here is the single metal. It's going to switch places with B. Um, the non-metal here in this example is going to switch places with Y. And notice now, X was single here, but now Y is single, but X is coupled with B and X. Um, here, A was single, B was is coupled with B and Y. Notice now when A comes in, it bumps B, makes B single, and A combines with Y. So the, the metal combination, metal, uh, non-metal combination. Okay, so metal, non-metal. So if a metal is single, the metal is going to swap places with the other metal. That's single. If, the, if a non-metal is single, it will switch places with the non-metal in the ionic compound. Okay. So hopefully when you actually see it with actual elements, it will make um, a little more sense. So here we have um, some examples here at the bottom. Okay. So let's try to use a different color use green here. Okay, so notice here we've got a metal that's by itself, copper, and we've got silver nitrate coupled, right? Metal, non-metal combination. When I, when I refer to coupled, the term coupling, um, it's the ionic compound, metal, non-metal combination, whether that non-metal is uh, a single metal, um, like in nitride, or if it's a polyatomic um, but anyhow, so copper, single metal, is going to swap places with a metal. So metals can switch places, okay? Um, Non-metals will switch places um, if it all depends on which atom is single. So in this case, we've got a metal that's single. It's going to switch places with the other metal in the reaction. So the end result bumps silver all by itself. And we've got copper one combined with nitrate. Um, you'll notice here we didn't so we didn't state which copper we used. Um, my advice to you is to use if I don't give you a number, you can use any number. But to make things simpler for you, try to use the common charge. So if the two metals have a common charge. In this case, silver has a plus one, so does copper, but copper has a plus one and a plus two. My advice to you is use the one with the same charge because in the end, there's going to be nothing to balance. Okay, it, It's going to work out to an already balanced equation. Okay, I typically will give you the metals that I want, or sorry, I, I will typically give you the oxidation numbers that I want you using um, in a question, but if I don't, for example, or if in a sample problem it doesn't give it to you, um, use the one that has the common valence, common um, oxidation number with the other metal. Okay. Um, here, in this case, uh, with the next one, let's see if I could zoom in. Is it letting me zoom in? 
Let's see. There we go. Okay, so let's zoom in there. Let's get this a little bit bigger. Okay, let me get rid of all the text that's here. Now, um, in this next case here, we've got calcium plus water. It seems like it might be one of those synthesis reactions that we just looked at in the previous lesson, but it's not. It's, um, it's a single displacement. And here, in this case, notice how I rewrote water. I rewrote water in this case as HOH because this way, this first H, we're going to pretend to be the metal, that it's going to switch places with the calcium. So calcium is going to bump the H, come together with the hydroxide instead, leaving the hydrogen on its own. Um, let's... Um, I don't have uh, here. These are all. Uh, these are all. Uh, so in all these cases, these are all the metals that are um, um, that are switching places. I just had a moment where I just ended up forgetting everything for a second. Now, um, one thing to make note: you'll notice here there are two unusual products. Um, this NR. This NR means no reaction. So what that means here. And let's uh, let's bring this back to um, its size. Uh, so the no reaction is this. So if we look at what was supposed to happen here, notice here gold is by itself. So gold should bump lithium and come together with nitride. But let's look for um, for gold on the um, um, on this activity series. So what we've got here is this activity series. And this activity series states um, the reactivity of the metal only in these single displacement reactions. The higher it is up here, the harder it is to displace it. So they're not going to switch places. Okay, so here is gold. Okay, gold is here at the bottom. And it's going, it's trying to switch places with lithium. Lithium's too powerful on that scale. So if lithium, okay, if lithium is holding on to nitride because it is very, it's a very strong metal, it's got a strong attraction with the non-metal, this gold, because it is weaker on that activity series, it will not be able to bump it. See here with these examples, copper was able to bump silver because of where it appears. But here, gold, unfortunately, lies at the bottom. So if the single metal, if you combine, if you look at the metal that is coupled, so the metal that's coupled was lithium. Lithium is with nitride coupled. Um, gold here at the bottom is single. So if the single metal is lower in the activity series, no reaction will take place. But if originally gold, let's say, um, was combined with nitrogen, okay, if gold was combined with nitrogen and it was trying to react with lithium and lithium was by itself, if the atom that is by, or the metal, should I say, is by itself, and it is higher on the activity series, it will, in fact, bump the weaker metal. So it'll bump the weaker metal to combine with the non-metal. Okay. So let's clear that. Now, this is when we have a metal that is single. What happens if we are looking at a non-metal that is single? Oh, and by the way, um, the periodic table that I have, and you'll see it, um, you'll see it on my website, and you'll see it at the uh, uh, in the comments section of the YouTube video um, when I upload it. Um, you can access the periodic table. That periodic table will, in fact, have this activity series for you to follow. Okay, so there's another activity series, and this one I don't give you, but it's really the elements on the periodic table. Uh, sorry, it's, it's the order that they appear in the periodic table um, for the halogens. So when the halogen is single, in this case here, notice here, chlorine, chlorine, we, it's by itself, plus sodium bromide. 
right? Ionic. So chlorine is a non-metal, so it'll switch places with bromine. Okay, so it'll switch places with bromine to come together with sodium chloride, bumping bromine all by itself. But remember also bromine is also um, diatomic. Okay, chlorine also diatomic. But now let's look at this other one here. Calcium and fluorine and iodine. Iodine is by itself. So iodine is single. So the single metal is low. Sorry, the single non-metal, sorry, the single halogen is low. The coupled halogen is high. So Ca is together with F. Right, to form CaF2. So this single iodine wants to bump calcium, but it can't because calcium, oh, sorry, uh, wants to bump, sorry, fluorine, excuse me, sorry, fluorine. It wants to bump fluorine, but it can't because fluorine, in fact, is too high on the activity series. So it's got a very strong hold on its uh, metal. In this bottom example here, bromine is by itself. So let's clear some of this stuff here. So with this last one here, um, bromine is by itself. It wants to come together with potassium and iodine. Okay, so this one is single. So notice how the single one is higher on the activity series. So this bromine is going to want to bump the iodine. Can it do it? Yes, it can because the single halogen is higher on the activity series than the coupled halogen, okay? And the coupled is this Ki, and that's why uh, a reaction will, in fact, take place. So be aware that sometimes in the single displacement, single displacement, this is the only time, this lesson here, single displacement where you will see this activity series. You will not see it with, um, with any of the other uh, types of reactions. Okay, so please be aware of them for the, as the single displacement reactions. Um, so I've got a bunch of sample problems for you to, uh, to look at. Okay, we're going to just talk about the, act in terms of the activity series um, and, and see quickly if we can see a, a reaction, can a reaction take place. So here we have aluminum reacts with, oh, aluminum all by itself. Okay, so we look for aluminum. Here it is, okay, aluminum, aluminum is single. It wants to combine with lead nitrate. Okay, so here's lead. So lead nitrate will aluminum bump lead. And yes, it will because if the single metal is higher on the activity series than the coupled metal, they will switch places. But if this was the other way around, and if the single metal was lower, they will, there will be a no reaction. Okay, so hopefully um, that was clear. Again, work on the practice problems. If you have any questions, concerns, um, please feel free to, um, to ask. Let's move on to double displacement reactions. So we are going to look at two types within this double displacement reaction. Um, and these two types are uh, the double displacement reaction and neutralization reactions. They work the exact same way, uh, but there's a difference between um, this, uh, the double displacement and the neutralization. And because in the neutralization, so the way things move around uh, is exactly the same between the two. Um, but a neutralization focuses strictly on um, combining an acid and a base to neutralize. Okay, so um, we're going to skim through some of this rather quickly because I just want to, we're going to see a lot of this again in unit three. Okay, so we're going to kind of just simplify it to what you needed to know for grade 10. Um, double displacement. When we get to unit three, that's when we will um, you know, dive right into some of the trickier double displacement reactions. So the only thing I want you to worry about for double displacement reactions is this. Everything is coupled. So we've got 
ionic compounds. So in these ionic compounds, we've got our metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non so all we're going to be doing now is this metal is going to combine with this non-metal, and this metal is going to combine with that non-metal in the end. That's all they're doing. Okay, there's no activity series to worry about. Um, we're just swapping them. But again, rule of thumb is when we're putting together these formulas, um, be aware that we're still following that crossover rule, right? We're still going to need to know those polyatomics. Have those um, handy when you are working on these problems. Okay, so let's skim through. Let's see what we need to, uh, if there's any uh, little bits um, that we're going to uh, look at. Um, we're not going to worry. Um, we're not going to worry about this, but I will just kind of talk a little really quickly about it. Uh, because we are dealing with ionic compounds, uh, typically uh, they are uh, aqueous solutions. Okay, um, and typically for, uh, not all double displacement reactions will occur. However, just for this first unit right now, um, we're going to assume they all occur. Okay, they will only occur if one of these three things happen. But for our sake, for unit one, we're going to assume every double displacement reaction takes place. Okay, so let's move forward. Um, so what I would um, expect you to do uh, would be uh, the sample problems, the first set of sample problems for the double displacement um, set of slides. Okay, uh, so that's all we're going to, to work on in terms of double displacement reaction. So let's just really quickly look at this, uh, this first one here. So we've got lead to nitrate reacts with potassium iodide. So lead is the metal, lead, the metal is gonna combine with the non-metal in the products. This metal here, potassium, is gonna combine with the nitrate. Understand that the, when you're putting those two together, their charges apply. When we put these two together, their charges apply. But then when we put now the new set of products, now a new set of crossover is going to, uh, to take place. So you're gonna be doing the crossover rule four times for the two reactants and the two um, products that they will form, okay? And that's how all of these uh, will work. So please do, um, do work on these sample problems. Let's see what else uh, we're going to move on. We're not going to worry about precipitate reactions. We're not going to worry about this. Um, if uh, you'll notice that the periodic table that I've given you, it has this on the back. We are going to see this in unit three. Okay, so we're going to simplify unit one, not talk about it in unit one, just kind of do review really, which is grade 10 stuff um, in um, uh, for this unit one. We'll dive right into this stuff um, in unit three when we get to unit three, okay? Um, same thing goes with these gases. We're not gonna worry, because uh, some double displacement reactions will actually uh, undergo further decomposition reactions within the double displacement, but we're not gonna worry about it, okay? So rule of thumb here, if we have a metal-nonmetal combination reacting with a metal-nonmetal combination, Double displacement reaction. Double because remember a single displacement, there was something that was single all by itself combining with something that is coupled. But now this double displacement, it means everything's double. Everything is coupled. Metal, non-metal plus another metal, non-metal. Okay, the two metals will switch places combining with new non-metals for the final product. Okay, so let's um, look at... Um, oh, do I not have it? What? Neutralization. There we go. Neutralization reactions. So a neutralization reaction um, is a reaction where we combine an acid and a base. Okay. So how do I know if something's a base? Look for the hydroxide. How do I know something's an acid? It'll say an acid or it'll have the letters AQ in the formula. So what happens here is, right, metal, non-metal. And then sulfuric acid, well, it's not until you write out the formula 
that you'll identify. And it's not really a metal, but we pretend it's a metal. And we pretend that the H is the metal and the sulfate in this example here is the non-metal. So potassium, the metal is gonna combine with the sulfate. The hydrogen is gonna combine with the hydroxide. Remember where we saw that before? The hydrogen combines with the hydroxide to form water. And remember when we were talking about that rule of thumb, if you see a hydroxide on one side, look for water on the other side. And water to help you with the balancing, write it out as HOH so that the H from the acid is going to be balanced with the H from the water. The hydroxide part will be balanced, balancing with the um, hydroxide of, um, of water. Okay, um, there are some sample problems um, uh, at the end. So there are only two sets of sample problems I want you to work on um, in this, um, in the double displacement neutralization lesson. It's the very first set of sample problems and the last set of sample problems, just these three here. Okay, and again, answers uh, are, um, are available. You can still try, you can still use the other sample problems as practice. But don't worry about all the additional steps that take place. Ignore the no reaction part. We're assuming all double displacement reactions will in fact take place. Okay, so if you come across this lesson, it's really important to, to know that um, just for argument's sake, we are gonna just kind of hold off on the, that rule. Okay, and that's uh, double displacement and neutralization reactions. Uh, our last lesson for tonight, and this will wrap up um, unit one. We'll be talking about a unit one test um, next week. Okay, um, I'll bring it up at the end of this, um, this lesson. But uh, let's look at the last lesson here because uh, I, don't, I shouldn't need too, too much time um, at the end to kind of address that. So complete and incomplete combustion reactions, really short one. There's nothing moving around in this one. This one's just strictly memory. Um, again, uh, it, it should be really easy to, uh, to remember, okay? Um, there's a whole chemistry um, based on carbon-based compounds, and that's referred to as organic chemistry. So typically, um, any carbon-containing compound are considered organic, except for um, compounds that contain carbon, like carbon dioxide is not considered organic, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, any, any carbonate compound, like a calcium carbonate, those are not considered organic. Um, but organic pretty much looks at um, chains of, of hydrocarbons, like um, methane gas, um, ethane uh, gas. Um, uh, so just chains of carbons and hydrogens. These are, are typical, our standard uh, organic chemistry. Um, it's, a, it's a field of chemistry that you will be looking at in the grade 12. Um, and there is a whole second year organic chemistry uh, course. Uh, pretty, it was a pretty challenging course when I took it in university, um, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and, um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, so it's a whole, it's got its own chemistry to it. Anyhow, uh, we're just gonna look at the, the, the simple type of reactions, which are um, uh, at these, exo, these so-called exothermic reactions in the form of complete and incomplete combustion reactions. So there's two types of combustion uh, reactions. There's a complete and an incomplete. Both complete and incomplete will form carbon dioxide and water. So these are the products of both types of reactions. The, the reactants is a, some kind of a hydrocarbon and to burn a hydrocarbon, you need oxygen gas. So these two are also always found in uh, both types of reactions. Okay, but there is a difference though in the incomplete in the sense that in an incomplete, oops, 
in an incomplete combustion reaction, we form two additional products. And those additional products are the poisonous gas, uh, very toxic, uh, odorless, uh, known as carbon monoxide, and just carbon soot. So it's just carbon, um, uh, carbon solid. These states, don't worry about the states, okay? We're gonna worry about states in unit three, okay? So if you look at what we have here, we've got a hydrocarbon burning in oxygen, produces carbon dioxide and water. The only one that has two additional products is the incomplete combustion. So the incomplete combustion implies we don't have ample amounts of oxygen present to cause something to burn. So few things, where, where does this kind of work? If you have a real fireplace, it's important to kind of seal off the fireplace, um, you know, before, or like when you're leaving the room, um, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to lower the amount of oxygen. You're trying to suffocate the fire of whatever's um, in the fireplace. So by sealing it, closing it up, um, you do that, okay? Um, when you do that, you try to suffocate the um, whatever's burning. Okay. However, it's very toxic. So what happens is it actually forms um, carbon monoxide gas, right? But that's, think of it, it, it empties out into the, the chimney and leaves the house, right? If you have cracks, um, let's say leading up from the, you know, the chimney into parts of the house, that could be dangerous. That's why typically you install a carbon monoxide detector. Uh, you typically install it um, closest to the bedrooms um, to wake you up because it's a silent killer. If there's a carbon monoxide, um, um, I guess, leak in the house, you're not going to be able to smell it if, if the detector wasn't there. And so easily you could kind of, you know, fall asleep and never wake up again. That's, that's how poisonous it is. So what happens is, how does it work? And how does it suffocate? How does it kind of involve in, in your bloodstream? You breathe in oxygen. That oxygen, and this goes to the bio students, um, this oxygen goes into the hemoglobin in red blood cells. However, the hemoglobin in red blood cells have a very strong affinity, okay, to carbon monoxide, right? We don't need it but it just has a very strong bond to it. So if it's present, red blood cells will suck up that carbon monoxide. And so what you're gonna be doing is now you're gonna be depriving your body of the oxygen that it needs. And so that red, those red blood cells carry oxygen throughout the body. And if it's being kind of saturated with carbon monoxide, it's not going to be moving oxygen throughout the body and eventually you know, puts the person to sleep and they, could probably never wake up if they are not attended to, if they're not put into a room where there's ample oxygen. Uh, one of the reasons why you never want to, um, typically you don't want to warm up a car um, with a closed garage, right? So if in the winter time you want the car, or, you know, you might run the car um, to kind of heat it up before you go into it. It's ideal to not be in the car while you're doing it and have the garage door sealed, right? Um, so people have passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and the carbon soot, that's just the, the blackening, right? So if you were to put your finger in the inside of the, the chimney and just wipe away, your fingers will come out all blackened. That blackening, that's the carbon soot, okay? That's, um, that's what forms, um, that's that as a, as a byproduct, okay? So, um, Let's clear this. Okay, so how would, would questions look like in terms of what I would give you? Um, this is a, a format that I might give you. I might actually give you um, just the hydrocarbon. Okay, so I might give you the hydrocarbon and state it's a complete combustion. So, um, so we've got here, notice here I'm using the same two hydrocarbons. Okay, so Here's hydrocarbon. It's a complete combustion, so we're burning it in oxygen. We burn both incomplete. The numbers that you use for balancing will not tell you if it's a it's a, um, right. Don't don't be fooled by whatever number you put in front of the oxygen as 
identifying if it's single, or sorry, if it's a, a complete or incomplete combustion reaction. Okay, those numbers are just for, for balancing, uh, for stating uh, where all the atoms kind of really lie. So don't, um, like when they're kind of rearrange themselves. So th that has nothing to do with identifying. To identify if something is an incomplete combustion, what you're looking for is not the carbon dioxide, not the water, but the carbon monoxide and carbon that are the additional products in an incomplete combustion reaction. So both of these examples, one and two, will have all of this. So one and two will both have this, but sample problem number two will have this part here in addition to all that that I've circled, okay? And of course, um, understand also when balancing uh, incomplete combustion reactions, there are multiple ways in which they can balance. Um, so be aware that um, the numbers might not match with that of a friend, okay? I know sometimes when I'm balancing, I'll get a set of numbers the way I work it out, and then a student might, you know, hand in an incomplete combustion reaction balance and I see the numbers and they don't match mine. But what I do is I typically will physically go in and count them and see, does this combination of numbers, does it work? Okay. So don't be, don't get, don't panic. If you come across a sample, uh, you know, a question and you're like, Hey, you know, you ask someone like, did you balance this? What did you get? Um, and you find out that their incomplete combustion reaction is different. Incompletes can have multiple coefficients that work out in the end, right? Because look at it. You've got, so look, at, look at everywhere you can balance carbon from, right? Look at everywhere you can balance oxygen from, right? So they, you can get multiple combinations, but complete combustion reactions, they will have one set of numbers um, only. Okay. So um, I am going to wrap it up there for today. Um, I will leave it to you guys for um, if you have. I hope you liked this video. If you did, do not be shy to hit that thumbs up button. And while you're clicking the thumbs up, click on that subscribe to stay tuned to my new videos. Thanks for watching.